Well, my name is Amy Lucero. I am Pastor Jimmy's wife. Um, we've been married 19 years. Yeah, last week, a couple weeks ago, we were 19 years. Um, and we are the pastors at the South Campus. Where's our South Campus peeps? Yep. <laughs> Um, I also serve on the pink team ministry with Pastor Trish, his pink team. And so I'm going to do a shameless plug right here. Um, May 13th and 14th, we are having our women's conference. And ladies, you do not want to miss this. Our women's conferences are anointed. We have a special speaker, Jennifer Evaz is coming, and she deals in intercessory prayer and deliverance and inner healing. And so you want to register for that. The link is online on Facebook, and I think it'll be up on our um, website as well. So tonight, what I'm going to be talking about is if you are in school of ministry, or if you serve on the worship team, or if you serve on the pink team, we are all reading this book, The Bait of Satan by John Bevere. And so tonight, that is what I'm going to be talking about. The Bait of Satan is a, a book written about offense, being offended, getting your feelings hurt, and then holding on to that. That is offense. And so John talks about hunting. I'm not a hunter. I love animals. That would hurt my feelings <laughs> to see that die, right? But a hunter needs two things when you're trying to catch something. It needs a trap and it needs a bait. And the enemy does the same thing for our lives. And he does this, he uses this particularly in the church because we have gotten freedom and so we're no longer bound in addictions and we're no longer bound with things of the world. And so he does a different approach in the church and it's offense. And so Luke 17, one, it says this, then said he unto his disciples, it is impossible that offenses will come, but woe unto him through whom they come. So he's saying as long as you're alive and breathing, offense is gonna come. Offense will come your way. But man, woe in the King James, when it says woe, I don't even know what that means, but I'm like, whoa, like that sounds bad. If you are the one who is purposely offending and bringing offense into people's lives. And so in the Greek, the word offense is the word scandalon. And there's a picture, I don't know, TJ, if you have that. The word originally refers to the part of the trap to which the bait is attached. So you have this middle part of the trap. That's the scandal on, and that's where the bait is put. So walk through this with me. I'm pretty visual, so I'm like, okay. The hunter puts the trap out, hides it in the grass and the leaves, right? So that the animal can stumble upon it. Puts the bait. I say cheese because all I've caught was mice before, <laughs> so I don't know anything else that you would put in there, right? <laughs> So the animal comes, takes the bait, and then the trap, it traps it. And what will happen to the animal is one of two things. It's either going to die or it's going to wiggle its way out and be free, but it's going to bleed out everywhere and it's going to be wounded for its little life. It's the same thing for us. We take the bait of offense. The trap snaps. And we will either spiritually die or we'll wiggle free. We'll get a little freedom. I'll go to freedom class with Pastor Dijon and get a little freedom, but I'm still going to hold on to that because how dare they did that, right? But I'm going to bleed out. And usually we bleed out onto our family and those close to us. And we'll walk the rest of our life wounded. We have to know the plan of the enemy. So John Bevere talks about two different categories of people who are offended. The first one is those who have been treated unjustly. And those people are people who have had really hard lives, unjust lives. They've suffered abuse. They're living out consequences of other people's choices, an unjust life. Then there's those who believe they have been treated unjustly. And a lot of us fall into that one. And so, for example, that second one is we have an expectation on people. And when they don't meet that expectation, we get offended. So let me give you an example. I'm going to use Pastor Hunter because he's in the front row, right? <clears throat> so someone comes up to me and says, I am so offended with Pastor Hunter. 
oh, wow, what, what did you do? I saw him at Walmart, and he didn't say hi. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, do you know him? Like, have you talked to Pastor Hunter? Well, no, I don't know him. I mean, we're Facebook friends, but I, I've never talked to him. But he didn't say hi to me. Okay. Well, do you serve with him on any of his teams? No, I don't serve. I just show up to church and leave. I can't believe he didn't say hi to me. And so then we have this offense. Poor Hunter, he's like, man, I was just trying to get, you know, some deodorant. And now now I'm the most hated pastor on staff because I didn't say hi. But do you see how that offense happens? We have an expectation, and sometimes it's unrealistic of it. That happens. A lot of times we see this happen in our families. How many of you have heard, I do everything for everyone and no one does anything for me. I cook all the time. I'm not cooking anymore. Y'all can just have beans. I'm not cooking anything else for Thanksgiving, right? There's an expectation and it's not met. So then we become offended. Can I tell you that if we do anything for anyone else, let's do it in expecting nothing in return. Because when we do stuff for people and be like, okay, I'm going to bless you, babe, but you better do for me. And if you don't, I'm going to hold account. Well, he didn't do this. Or sister so-and-so didn't do, you know what? I did did so much for sister so-and-so. Y'all, I grew up AG, so sister and brother is in my lingo. (laughs) I'll never do for them again. But so we, in in a way, set ourselves up for offense. But if we bless someone, I'm going to bless you, and I expect nothing in return. I do it because I love you. I do it because I'm obedient to the Lord. And if you never give me anything back, that's okay. I did it unto the Lord. So let's look at this. There's three ways that show that I'm living in offense. And we're going to take inventory of this. Excuse me. And as I go through these things, think, okay, is this me? Lord, search my heart. Okay. I love the song that we say that we sang, and it said, "You make the wrong things right. You set the wrong things right." And so my prayer tonight is, Lord, if there's something wrong that's set, you think about a broken bone, and if it's set, they have to break it again so it can set right. Lord, if there's anything in us tonight, set it right. Amen. So here are three ways that show I'm living in offense: pride. Pride says, "Oh, I'm not hurt or offended." Well, I don't, I don't care. I don't care. It's fine. Yeah, what they did really hurt, but I don't care. It is, I'm tough. I'm strong. It doesn't bother me. And so we push those things down, push them down. But can I tell you, when you push things down, eventually it's going to come back up. In some way or another, it will come and reveal itself. Pride masks the true condition of our hearts. And you will never change when you think everything is fine. When you cause, I'm fine, I'm fine. Oh, I don't need, I'm fine, I'm fine. That's pride. And you can never change anything until you admit, okay, wait, I'm, that, it's not okay. It's not okay. Pride, the second thing, causes you to see yourself as the victim. So then we say, oh yeah, I'm hurt. Oh yeah, I'm mad. I can't believe, did, can you believe what they did? I'm hurt. And then we make inner vows. And we say, I will never fill in the blank. I will never work at that place again. I will never serve in this ministry again. I will never attend whatever, right? We make inner vows. Part of that is pride. The victim mentality says, I was mistreated. I was misjudged. Therefore, I have the right to act this way. In our culture and in our society that we live in right now, we are all about rights. What's your right? What, this is my right. This is my right. Can I tell you, when we come to the feet of Jesus, our rights are surrendered at the cross. We have to lay them down. And it's true. You do have a right. It's valid. That pain and whatever you went through, it's, it's, it's valid. You, have, you do. You have every right to hate or to be angry. But when we're walking in the things of the Lord, he changes us. It says we're a new creation and the old man comes off and the new, he does something new in our hearts and in our lives. The third thing, pride distorts our vision. Have you gone to the optometrist and they're like, this lens, this lens, this, and you're like, no, I can't see, 
I can't see anything with that lens, right? Pride does that to ourselves spiritually. It hardens our hearts and it dims and clouds your eyes of understanding. When no one can tell you anything, there's pride and your eyes are dim. Let me ask a question and don't answer out loud and don't answer for your spouse either. Who in your life can tell you no? Who in your life can tell you no? Who in your life can speak truth into your life and you receive it? You don't buck. You don't, oh, no, man, no, no. No, I'm just trying to tell you, like, be careful. You're, you're, you're wandering away. No, you can't tell me what to do. Don't judge me, right? Then we start, who can speak into your life then? Who can speak truth? Pride distorts your vision. The last thing pride does is it keeps us from a change of heart. You see, with offense and anger and unforgiveness, we usually categorize it as a weakness or a struggle. Oh, it's just something I'm struggling with. And, and I don't like her. And, and I have a list of people that I'm praying for, right? I'm praying for. I have a list of people that they're on my bad side and I'm not, I'm not ever going to deal with them ever again. But I'm not a murderer I'm not an adulterer. I'm not whatever you think is the worst sin. But can I tell you that offense leads to bitterness. Bitterness leads to anger. And anger does not inherit the kingdom of God. So when you walk in offense and unforgiveness, you're right there with the murderer. You're right there with the adulterer. And we categorize sin to make us feel better. Pride keeps us from a change of heart. We have to recognize the weight of holding on to unforgiveness and offense. And surrender and repentance is what will set you free. I want to read 2 Timothy 2, 24 through 26, and it says, A servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but must be kind to everyone. Be able to teach and be patient with difficult people. What? Difficult people is what it said. Gently instruct those who oppose the truth. Perhaps God will change those people's hearts and they will learn the truth. Then they will come to their senses and escape from the devil's trap. For they have been held captive by him to do whatever he wants. Has the Lord say, don't fight, don't quarrel. Um... I remember a time when Jimmy and I were engaged, and I'm already like a happy person, <laughs> but I was really happy when I got engaged, right? Because <laughs> I'm like, I'm gonna have a honeymoon night. That's what I was thinking in my head. <laughs> and so, I don't know what y'all are laughing about. I was just <laughs> and my dad would get up in front of the church and say, let's pray that the Lord comes before Amy's wedding. And I was like, no, anyways. <laughs> But I worked at an insurance company, very happy, very excited to get married, very enjoying the season of my life. And at that time, I switched departments. And the department that I came to had six very strong women. And I was like, okay, I can do that. My mom, Mama Stella's strong. Y'all know Mama Stella. I can, I can do it, right? Mama Stella's an OG. Anyways. So... I started working there, and there was one lady, and she did not like me. There was nothing that I could do that this woman would not like me. Well, at that time, during a midweek service like this, they were doing a sermon series on loving your enemies and how to pray and love your enemies. And so I remember at an altar call, I answered, and I said, Lord, show me how do I love her, and what do I do? And I remember the Holy Spirit said, serve her. And I said, serve her? We serve in the church. What would I do at work? How do I serve her? And that's all he would say is he just said, serve her. So I went to work, and I would get there early before anyone else, and I would make the coffee for everyone. But then I heard the Holy Spirit say, serve her. So I'm like, all right, I'll serve her coffee. <laughs> so I made her coffee, and I put it on her desk, and then I go and I sit. She comes in. She walks by me because she has to pass by my, my desk. And she said, what's this? In front of everyone. 
And I'm like, oh. And I said, oh, it's coffee. I, I got you some coffee so you wouldn't, you know, have to go to the break room. And she said, why? And I said, oh, <laughs> I don't know. Like, <laughs> I'm trying to love my enemies. And so I said, I, I just, you know, I just thought so that you don't have to go to the break room. And she said, oh. And she goes, I was mortified. I was embarrassed because everybody, every, all of those ladies are like looking. And I'm like, don't cry. Don't cry. <laughs> Go to your desk. I was so embarrassed. So then the, the next day happens. I'm there early in the morning and I heard the Lord again. Holy Spirit said, serve her. And I was like, did you not? Were you there? Did you see that? <laughs> and so I made her coffee, put it on her desk. She did the same thing. What'd you put in it? What are you trying to do, kill me? No, I just, you know, she's not saved. So I'm like, I'm being obedient to the Holy Spirit. I couldn't say that, you know, I didn't want to freak her out. So it's like, I, I, just, um, I, I just thought you would like some coffee. I do this for a week. And for a week, she does that and throws it. And then she walks by my desk to go get her, <laughs> her own cup of coffee and walks by and glares at me every time. <laughs> So then the next week starts, Holy Spirit says, serve her. And I said, no, sir, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. She can get her own coffee. Mm. <laughs> right? So she comes to work and she said, Amy. And I'm like, oh, there's no coffee there. I don't know why she's. And she said, where's my coffee? And I said, well, I didn't get you any because you've been throwing it away. So... And she said, no, I want it. This is how I like it. And I said, okay, I'll get it for you. And so the, the rest of my time in that workers' comp department, I served this woman coffee. And there were moments where I would see her heart and heart kind of, kind of, soften. <laughs> and I'm going to get hard again, soften and harden. And in this company, the owner was a Christian, and so he offered um, like Bible studies for 30 minutes, two times a week. And so I'd ask her, hey, come with me. And she was like, no. I'm like, okay, we'll never ask again. <laughs> when I left that company, she threw me the greatest, the best see you later party I've ever had. And I would love to say, and we became best friends, and we're, but that didn't happen. <laughs> but she said, I guess you're all right. And I was like, I'll take it. <laughs> Years later, she calls me. I see her name come up, and I'm like, oh, my gosh. And she calls, and she says, hey, how are you? I said, I'm good. How are you? I'm still working here. She said, hey, I just wanted to call and let you know that um, I got saved the other day. And I said, you did? That's awesome. And she said, yeah, but I needed to call you and tell you something. She said, you were nice to me all the time, and you remember when you tried to give me coffee? I said, oh, yeah, I remember. <laughs> and she said, I need to tell you, the reason why I was so mean to you is because I had made some choices in my life when I was a teenager. And I regretted those choices, and I hated myself, and I hated everyone around me, and I hated God, and I hated you because you were so happy with Jim Deere. She would call him Jim Deere. Jim Deere, how's Jim Deere? And so she said, and you were so happy with Jim, and I hated you for that. And she said, but I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And I said, no, girl, it's good. We're sisters in Christ. It's good. It's good. We're good. You see, in that time, I could have been like, that first time that she dropped, I would have been like, oh, well, uh, I'm out. Like, I'm not doing that. And switch me departments. I don't want to be in here. The tension was crazy. But I know now it wasn't even about me. <laughs> It was like this verse where it said, gently instruct those who oppose the truth. Sometimes we don't have to instruct with our words, it's with our actions. And then it says, perhaps God will change those people's hearts and they will learn the truth. And I don't tell you that story to be like, look what I did know, because I almost quit a lot of times. <laughs> I tell you that story to be whatever you're facing, whatever you're doing, be obedient to Holy Spirit when he tells you serve them because it's not about you, it's about him. 
It's about him trying to love through you. It's about him trying to speak kindness to you. The word says it's the kindness and the goodness of the Lord that draws us back to repentance. But if you're dishing it back and being like, oh, here's your coffee, girl. Where's the kindness and the repentance that's going to be shown and displayed through your life? Do the hard things. The second thing we do, so the first thing we do, we have pride. The second thing we do in our lives that keeps us in offense, we build walls. There's walls. Proverbs 18, 19, it says, A brother offended is harder to win than a fortified city. And contentions are like the bars of a castle. Walls back in the day were built around cities to keep thieves and riffraff and people out. Or when there was an army coming, they would even put more gates and stuff up because they could be able to defend themselves. But we do the same thing. We build walls around our heart because we've been wounded and we've been hurt. And so we say, nope, never again. Nope. And I've been guilty of that. I have done that. Where I'm like, um, that's never going to happen. I'm going to build this wall here. The thing about walls is that it keeps even the good out. Everyone is out. Everyone is out. Or the people that we do let in are the people who are on our side. Oh, you're on my side. Okay, girl, come in, come in. But the thing about that is I'm building my wall and I'm building theirs. And before you know it, we're isolated in this wall of captivity. And misery loves company, right? Because of high walls, we want to receive everything that the Lord has for us. God, give me your glory. Give me your presence. Give me your whole, Lord, give me, give me, give me, give me. But I'm not going to give that out. Because if I give out unconditional love, I'm opening myself up to get hurt again. But I want it. Give it to me. Forgive me. And forgive me for all, yes. You love me from the east, from the west. Yeah, but I'm not, I can't even love them. Right? Walls. We've got to surrender and allow the Lord to tear down our walls. The other thing that we do is we live life alone. One of the core values here at TWC is we don't do life alone, right? And there's a reason for that. When we walk in offense and we live an offended life, what do we do? We, we pull back, we withdraw, and we do life alone. But that's not how the Lord intended it to be. When we do life alone... And then we leave, because that's usually what happens, right? I had, I had every right <laughs> to leave that job and find something where people would be nice to me. I wanted to do that. But the Lord was doing something there. But a lot of times that's what we do. Oh, I don't like this. I'm leaving. And then we move somewhere. Oh, I don't like this. I'm leaving. I don't like this. I'm leaving. And we see this happen a lot in churches, or we pull back, right? But the issue with that is that you've been to 25 churches in six months and you've never grown roots. You've never allowed roots to grow down deep. I'm going back to school right now. I'm a college girl. Babe. (laughs) Jimmy's always like, I'm dating a college girl. (laughs) But I'm taking a botany class and it's all about plants. And so we had to learn root systems. And the thing about roots is I can plant something, but if I uproot it and try to plant it somewhere else every three weeks, I can give it water and I can give it food. But because that root system never grows down deep, it will die. But it's the same thing in our lives. We get uncomfortable, like, ooh, this is a trigger. I'm out. Nope, not doing it, I'm out. And the roots never grow down deep. And because the roots never grow down deep, then the things that grow from that plant, the Lord can't prune. Sometimes when we allow roots to grow, there'll be things that the Lord will say, oh man, I see, can I cut that off of you? Because I want you to grow more, right? When you prune something, you're wanting it to grow more. I don't, I kill everything. 
I, will, I love plants. I would love to grow them, but I kill them all. But we got to grow deep roots. Deep roots. Mark 4, 16, it's talking about the parable of the sower, and it says, the seed on the rocky soil represents those who hear the message and immediately receive it with joy. Man, PT, that was a great message. I got it. I receive it. Answer the altar call. Man, I'm good to go. But since they don't have deep roots, they don't last long. They fall away as soon as they have problems or offenses and or they're persecuted for believing God's word. It's even biblical. We have to let our roots grow down deep. So those three ways we know that we're living in offense, there's pride, we have walls, we live life alone and we don't allow deep roots to grow. So let me tell you some ways that you can be free from offense, okay? One, recognize that you're hurt. Lay the pride down and be like, okay, yeah. And it may be something like deep way down from a childhood. I met women who say, I'll never go to a pink conference because I don't like women. They're catty and they're mean and I don't like them. And when women say that, I'm like, there's a wound. Some woman hurt you. Maybe it was in middle school or you were picked on, but there's a wound there. And the Lord wants to heal and restore that because the life that's gonna be spoken over you may come from another woman. But because that wound is there and you're like, no, no, no. You'll never get that freedom. Recognize your hurt and lay the pride down. It's kind of like, um, it's fixing to be spring and so we're gonna be mowing our lawns, right? I helped Jimmy mow the lawn. We have a cool lawn mower, so I'm like, I'll mow it, I'll do it. And sometimes there'll be a lot of weeds that come up. And I'm like, just mow it, just mow it and make it look pretty. And Jimmy's like, no, babe, we're gonna have to have a day and pull up all the weeds. And I'm like, oh, I hate, I hate those days. But it's the same thing in our hearts. There are some things in our hearts that we need to pull and uproot so that good soil and good seed can be there and, and it can grow. But if we mow over the issue every time, weeds will sprout up and it will soon choke the life out of that land or choke the life out of your hearts. The second thing we do when we're offended is we pray for those who hurt you. Oh, I do. I pray, Lord, bless them. Thank you, Jesus, for them. Amen. No. Pray for them like you would pray for yourself. Pray for them like you pray for your children. Pray for them like, like you want a blessing for them. What I pray is, Lord, I want more of you. God, I want to experience the fullness of you. Lord, let them experience you in, in your fullness and in your glory. Lord, bless them in their going and their coming. Father, bless them financially. Bless them with peace. God, I pray that you would surround them with godly people who will speak life and love on them. Lord, be with them. That's how you really pray for them. And then, but at, the, at first, when you first do it, you're like, oh, and bless them, you know? But the more you do it, it's like exercise. I don't know anything about that right now. <laughs> but at one time, I loved running. And I would run 5Ks. And when I first started, I think I just had Avery. She's 12 now. And it was really hard. After you have a baby, you're like all, like, I couldn't jump rope. I was like, what happened to me? And it took some time for me to even start running correctly. It took time. I was sore. It hurt. But it's the same thing in our lives. It's kind of like exercise. The more that we pray for that person who has offended us and hurt us, the more that we speak life and speak blessing over them, then the next time someone comes and the offense is offered, you'll be like, nope, I'm not going to. You know what? I'm just going to pray for you. And you go at it. It's like exercise. The more you do it, the easier it will become. The third thing is allow the Lord to be your defender. Revenge is not ours. It's the Lord's. When the Lord is your defender, you can be at peace knowing that he never fails. He never fails. 
Allow the Lord to be your defender. The fourth thing, speak the word and forgive. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. So we can say, well, you know, I'm not a people person. I don't like people. Okay, then speak the word because Jesus is a people person. (laughs) His whole ministry was people. And if you want to be his hands and feet, you're going to have to love people. Okay, how do I do that? Speak the word. Father, I thank you that you love me. And so, Father, I pray that the way that you love me, help me to love people. Help me to see people the way that you see people. Give me your eyes. Give me your compassion. Give me your hands. Give me your feet. Because sometimes we can only do 10%. How many of you ever wake up like that and you're like, ooh, today's not a good day. Lord, I can only do 10% today, so I need you to do 90% of the loving, of the kindness, right? We have to speak the word. If it's not there in us naturally, then we speak the word. Find you scriptures. Find you scriptures about love. Find you scriptures about compassion. Put them on a sticky note. Put it in your car. So every time you go to Walmart, you're not fighting with the cashier. There's no cashiers anymore. (laughs) You're not fighting with the machine. But you speak the word until it gets in you. And when the word comes in you, it will naturally come out. The word. Forgiveness is huge in the kingdom of God. The Lord has forgiven us of so much. And that's the thing is, is an offended Christian sometimes forget a lot of the things that they were forgiven of, right? Forgiveness is this, to forgive is to set a prisoner free only to discover that the prisoner was you. Forgiveness, find you scriptures on forgiveness. I could read them all right now. But when you find them and you look for them yourself or when you ask Holy Spirit, show me, Show me scriptures on forgiveness. And he highlights that to you. That scripture means more to you than me telling you. Whatever it is that you're lacking to get free from offense, find the scripture. Speak the word. I am um, passionate about this book. I read this book probably about eight years ago. And I read it once a year. Because when you're dealing with people you're gonna be offended, right? But I also cling on to this book, and and not even this book, but this um, teaching on forgiveness because I really had to walk it out my whole life. I'm gonna be really vulnerable with you guys. When I was a little girl, um, my parents were pastors, and so they were people that they trusted to take care of me. And in their care, I was sexually abused every time. And so when the crime McGruff dog came to my school and said, hey, that they, they've ever done this, you know, tell your parents. So I told my mom. And that was it. And I forgot about it until I became a teenager. And when I became a teenager, I started having all of these, like, nightmares. And these nightmares were graphic And I had never seen pornography, so I was so confused. And then I realized, oh my gosh, these aren't nightmares, these are memories. And PT talks about how the devil is the hurt whisperer. When there is a hurt, the enemy will come and whisper more hurt to keep you bound, to keep you not free. And so I believed the lie that the enemy told me that you're dirty, that you're not enough, and you're not worthy of being defended. Because I thought, well, nothing happened. I said something and nothing happened. These people are still, well, nothing happened. What? And the enemy said, because you're not worthy. You're not worthy of being defended. So then I became angry, right? I was in that first category of people. It was unjust, and I was angry. And then I became angry at my mom because you didn't defend me. But little did I know, the truth was she did defend me. She actually went to go kill the man. Went to the most extreme way, 
like a mother would defend her child. And she talks about how when she went to lunge at him, she tripped and fell and she fell on her knees before this man who hurt her daughter. And the Holy Spirit showed her like a clip of a movie, her going to jail, my sister and I going through different homes, brokenness. And the Lord told her, I am your defender. So my mom has a testimony of her own of healing, restoration, redemption. And I can see now how the enemy tried to destroy her and me. And I'm so thankful for a mom who was obedient to the Holy Spirit and she said she picked herself up at the floor and left. And because I never spoke about it, she didn't speak about it. She just assumed that I had forgotten about it. And and, and so she didn't know. But see how the enemy is so, I hate, I hate the devil because he was going to have me believe that lie for the rest of my life. So when we finally had a conversation in my teenage years, she, and it was simple, like, why why are you so angry? Because word vomit, like teenage girls do, right? And she told me the truth. I didn't know, okay, now what? Now what do I do? I went to a Christian school and I had a Bible teacher and this Bible teacher took garlic supplements. <laughs> so his classroom smelled like garlic. It was great. And he would always give us packets and we would write the packet, write, write, fill in the blank. We'd memorize it for tests and that was it. Around this time, he gave us a packet on the bitterness tree. And he talked about how the enemy will come and he'll put a seed of anger, a seed of of offense and the seed when we nurture it we think about it it grows into a tree of bitterness and I'm visual so I'm thinking oh my gosh I'm walking around with this huge tree out my heart because that's me and I never said anything to anyone and I just looking back realized the Lord was doing something in me internally but I clung on to that teaching I still have the packet now the bitterness tree. So then when John Bevere came out with this book, same principles, right? I clung to it because I never want to go back to that place of anger again. I never want to go back to that place of offense again. And can I tell you, I did forgive the people who abused me. And forgiveness is a process. A lot of times people are like, oh, well, you, you get saved. And it's like, ah, forgiveness. No, I, would, I wish. <laughs> but we have to walk it out. And we walk it out step by step by being obedient. I'll be obedient, Lord, here. I'll be obedient here. I'll surrender here, God. The other day, we led worship. And my girls are on the worship team in the youth. And I remember... We were on the stage and I took a step back and I just kind of watched them. And the Lord said, all three of y'all are here because you allowed me to be your defender. And I thought, Lord, had I not, had I taken my earthly rights and said, no, it's my right. Where would my girls be? Where would my children be? See, the offense that you carry and you hold on to is not just yours. You bleed out, like we said at the beginning of the trap, onto your children. And so like you, they end up living consequences of your choices. In the end times, in Matthew 24, it talks about how in the end times, there will be people, lovers of themselves. We see that, right? And the hearts of many, because of offense, will grow cold. That statement will grow cold. That means at one time their hearts were warm. That means at one time their hearts were on fire for the Lord. And because of offense, it grew cold. We are living in the last days. I've been hearing that my whole life. But now more than ever, I'm like, oh goodness. We are living in the last days. Let us know the enemy's plan and let our hearts not grow cold. If you'll close your eyes, bow your heads with me. (laughs) 
I'm gonna take a moment and ask the Lord. You ask the Lord. Lord, am I walking in any area of offense? Am I walking in any area of offense, Lord? You may have been treated unjustly, but if anyone knows your pain, it's Jesus. Jesus was betrayed. Jesus was abandoned. Jesus was talked about. Jesus was brutally beaten. And yet he still chose to go to the cross and forgive the very ones that were causing harm. And so tonight, I just want to make an invitation. If that's you, if there's something in your life or in your heart that you're holding on to, I break pride in the name of Jesus. There's healing for you tonight. There's freedom for you tonight. And so I'm just going to ask you to come. Come and allow our altar workers to pray over you, to speak life over you. Online, wherever you're at, Jesus wants to meet you where you are. So if you need to pull over and ask the Lord, Lord, search my heart. If you need to kneel at your bedside and say, Lord, I surrender. I encourage you to do that. And I'm just going to pray, Father God, I thank you. I thank you, Lord, for your blood. I thank you, Lord, for what you did. Lord, I thank you for forgiving me of so much, God. Lord, forgive me for withholding that. Forgive me, God, for holding on to offense. Forgive me, God, for not releasing and, and pouring out love, God. Forgive me, Father. Some of you, your offense may be towards the Lord. You're offended with the Lord. And that's okay. He's not... That doesn't move him. He's still God. So, Father, I pray for that person, God. Holy Spirit, that you would minister to their hearts. Holy Spirit, that you would reveal that whatever happened wasn't you. It wasn't you. God, your word says that you have a plan for us, plans to prosper us, not to harm us, to give us a hope and a future. God, you came to give us life abundantly. But the enemy has a plan too, and the enemy's plan is to steal, kill, and destroy. And so, Father, I pray that you would reveal truth to that person. Reveal truth, God. Father, I pray, Lord Jesus, for any heart that is hard. Lord, would you soften our hearts? Soften our hearts, Holy Spirit. Soften our hearts, God. Lord, we lay down all pride. We lay it down, Jesus. Search our hearts, God. Search our hearts, Father. I speak healing, Father. People and heal healing in people's minds, healing in people's hearts, healing in their homes, healing in their marriage. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Lord, you're good. You're good, God. You're a good Father. You're good, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Lord. Holy Spirit, seal, Father, seal the blood of Jesus. Every work that you are doing in this place, God, seal it, God. Seal it, Jesus. Would you that are, if you're sitting, would you do us a favor and just stretch your hands out. We just want to pray over them. 
one more time. Father, I thank you that you're a God that sees. You see where the offense is. You see where the hurt is. And Father, I thank you that you are the great physician, that you're a God that heals. And so as you see them where they're at, I thank you that healing is beginning to happen in their heart, Lord, as they're dropping their offense and their hurts right now. Lord, I ask that you help them to have the strength to not pick it back up when they leave this altar, but they will leave it at the feet of Jesus. And Lord, I speak encouragement and life where there was none. I speak life over them. And I speak hope where they've felt hopeless, where anger has risen up, I speak peace. Lord, in areas of their life where they've felt unloved and unwanted and that's caused an offense, Lord, I ask that you reveal your love to them. Lord, show them how you see them. heart I just hear this one thing I think there's some some someone in this room that you've held an offense towards your parents even at, 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 at the age that we are at as as adults we've held on to this offense with our parents because of what you did not hear from them Because you didn't hear the I love you, because you didn't hear them speak any kind of life over you. It was just more of a constant, you're just like your uncle and you're gonna be just like your dad and you're gonna be just like your mom and, and they didn't mean that as a compliment. And because you have not had that spoken over you by parents, now you hold an offense to anyone in authority over you. If you would do me a favor and just with every head bowed, do me a favor, nobody looking around, I'm not gonna embarrass anybody, but if that's you and you say, yeah, that's me, I've got an issue with authority, I've got an issue with anyone that's in authority over my life because of issues from parents, and you say, that's me, that's me. It was like Amy just said, the first step is you've got to be able to acknowledge it. So if that's you, right where you're at, would you just put your hand up and say, yeah, that's, that's me. Thank you. I see, I see hands starting to go up. Here's what I want you to do is lay that offense at the altar. It is not yours. And can I tell you this? It is nothing that you did that you deserved it. I think you can sit back and be like, well, it's because I did this and because I did it, because I didn't do this. No, 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 no. That was not your choice. And what I would encourage you is don't leave this place the same as the way you walked in. Lay it at the altar. And so I'm gonna ask you, if your hand was up, would you allow us to pray with you? And there were multiple hands up. And again, I'm not gonna make you. This is your choice. You've got to make that decision. Do you want to live in that offense even for one more hour? Or do you wanna say, hey, I'm done. I can't do this anymore and I'm gonna give it over to him. So if that was you, if you put your hand up, I'm gonna ask you, make your way up here. Let us pray for you over that specifically. So Father, we come to you, Lord, in the name of Jesus. And there are some deep, deep wounds on the inside of some of them that have been hurt. They felt abandoned by, by a parental figure, by someone that was in authority over them. 
And because of that abandonment or because of them not hearing specific words of encouragement or hearing life spoken over to them, there's left this void, this emptiness on the inside. And so, Father, I thank you that you are the perfect piece. You are the missing piece to that puzzle that fits perfectly in that shape in their heart. And so, Father, I'm asking right now in the name of Jesus that that hurt and that wound, Father God, that at this moment you begin to do surgery on that. That there is healing and restoration that is beginning to happen right now and I speak life over them and I say they are a child of God and they are loved by the Most High. That they are seen by a father that knew them in their mother's womb before there were a twinkle in their daddy's eye, before they were ever created and thought to exist on this earth, you had purpose and destiny and a plan for them, Father. And so I speak healing over their heart. And Lord, as they lay that hurt at the altar, as they lay that down at your feet, Father, I thank you there is a freedom that begins to happen. That there is a weight that is taken off of their shoulders. That they feel lighter. And Father, for those that have those wounds in the absence of parents, Lord, I thank you that you love them enough to send someone into their life, not to take the place, but to take them into the new season that the Lord is calling them to. Lord, we speak that in the name above all names, in the name of Jesus. What a great presence of the Lord tonight, amen. What, Amy, fantastic, solid message. Now do you understand why we share the pulpit? <laughs> we have so many talented, so many gifted, so many anointed speakers here at the worship center. It's, it's so much bigger than one person holding a microphone. But I'm telling you, when you get into that book, if you've not read that book, Bait of Satan, don't read it if you don't want to change because you're just going to be mad the whole time. You're going to be mad at God. You're going to be mad at the guy that wrote it. You're going to be mad at the person that sold it to you. I mean, you, you're going to be mad at Amazon for dropping it off on your porch and stuff. I mean, it's, it's just one of those kinds of things. I just gave a book to, to Michael Hay yesterday. It's going to ruin his life. And he's going to be calling me in a couple of days and saying, why you give me this book? I think our school of ministry is fixing to read it. If you never read, read uh, A Tale of Three Kings, don't read that book either. Do not read that book if you don't want to change. I read that book every January, and I just read it again yesterday, and I already got saved again since yesterday. So, listen, I, I, I want to encourage you to be here Sunday to bring someone with you. I got a new series launching Sunday called Relationship. I know a lot of you are like, well, Pastor Todd, we just got out of a series on relationship. I'm talking about a relationship with the king. I think sometimes we work harder on other relationships than we worked on this relationship. And I said to the Lord a couple months ago, I said, God, I just want to be a better friend to you. You're a great friend to me. How can I be a better friend to you? And the Lord said, go read the Ten Commandments. And I was like... That's got nothing to do with being a friend. I don't need a rule list of do's and don'ts. I already known the ones I've messed up. I'm the only one. Y'all don't read that. Y'all don't look at the Ten Commandments and be like, Ten come, I done messed up everything in my life. Bless God. So we're going to talk about this week because here's what I want you to look at it. What if it's not a list of do's and don'ts? What if it's a list of principles of how we can have better intimacy with the king? 
And so luckily, I want you to know this, about three or four years ago, Pastor Robert Morris at Gateway did a series on the Ten Commandments, and I watched it four years ago. And while I'm praying, the Lord said, hey, go back and watch that video. And I said, like, what video? And I had forgotten all about it. So I'm going to do my best on this thing. But a lot of insight that I gained, I got from the Holy Spirit. But a lot of it I got from Pastor Robert Morris. And if you don't like Robert, then you probably won't want to come. But if you want to hear it preached the right way, go listen to Pastor Robert. And then come back and tell me how bad I stink at life, okay? But it's going to be a good series, and we're going to grow together. I just want to release you in prayer tonight. And I want to say I'm so proud of you. Uh, we raised over $4,000 for Bibles in India, and I'm so glad that I pastor a church that, that can catch the vision and seize the vision. I also want to encourage you one Sunday, if you're at 10 o'clock, I know that the seating arrangements are tight, and we've got this roped off and that roped off. I just want, we're not trying to ruin your life, and we're not trying to make you do something you don't want to do. But if you don't know the vision of the house, you'll get frustrated. But if you understand the vision of the house is to get as many patients into this room that we can see so that they can leave here healthy, then you won't mind scooting over a little bit because somebody might be a little bit broker than you are that Sunday. I wish I had half a church that believed in what I'm trying to say. And we're just going to shoot for that, man. We're going to shoot for that. We're going to pack this place out for the glory of the Lord so people can leave here better than the way they came. That's why we do it. We're not doing to squish you in. We're doing so we can get as most people in here as we can. If you, We have overflow next door. If you want to go next door at 10 o'clock and watch over there, you can. But I just want to close you in prayer. And the reason I want to close in prayer tonight is because the enemy is going to fight you over the decisions you made. Some of you are going to dream about the very person that you're trying to forgive. Some of you are going to relive the whole instance all up again. Maybe, or maybe we can lift up a standard against it right now. Come on, I believe we can lift up a standard against it right now that you don't have to have that kind of thing. So, Father, we come to you, the one that is the author and creator of dreams. And, Lord, we speak to the enemy that would try to torment and try to corrupt Father, we speak to the enemy to shut his mouth. And what the blood of Christ has covered tonight, the issues of brokenness, the issues of unforgiveness, the, the issue of releasing. Father, your word says that he that the Son set free is free indeed. So God, we stand on that word tonight and we say that you are truth all the time. Not sometime, but all the time. And we choose to believe the word of God over their mind. And so Lord, I pray protection over their mind. Is that they would go to sleep tonight. Lord, the only thing they would dream about is the power of the Holy Spirit that's going to give them the power to live in victory. Not from just moment to moment, but day to day and glory to glory in the name of Jesus. So I declare sweet dreams. Come on, somebody. I declare sweet dreams in the name of Jesus. I call those gifts and talents that have been hidden underneath the ground because of lack of forgiveness, Lord, that you didn't give those and you're not repentant and you haven't taken those back. But those things that have been lying dormant, I call back awake right now in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord God. And I pray that you would let them know that sometimes we get cold and in between the calling and the scent can sometimes be a different season. But Lord, we're calling for those things to come back alive right now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, everything that the enemy has stole from you, he owes you seven times. Seven times what's been taken. So I speak seven times worth of health back into your life. Seven times worth of prosperity back in your life. Seven times of love back in your family. Seven times of love back into your marriage. Seven years, the years that have been stolen, Lord, that you would, I don't know how you extend time, but you stop the sun, and I know that you can do it in the name of Jesus. And so those relationships that have been broken and the conversations we haven't been able to have and the birthdays that we miss, Lord, I call those 
goes back into fruition in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord God. And I pray that you would take us and that you would use us for your glory, Father, and that no weapon formed against us shall be able to prosper, Lord. And we recognize that you have made us not just conquerors, but more than conquerors to Christ Jesus that gives us strength. If you believe that, give God a good shout of praise. such a good word and we seal that prayer by the power of the blood of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit go and grow be what God called you to be if you're going to visit let's do it out in the hall because we still got people praying in here see you Sunday <laughs>